All right, welcome back. We're going to um, take on uh, the second part of World War II here. Uh, we spent the first section talking about the uh, the Treaty of Versailles, which is one of the main causes that's going to lead up to this this build up of fascism. Uh, we talked about the rise of Mussolini in um, in Italy. Uh, now let's let's talk about the rise of Adolf Hitler and Nazism in Germany. And so, like after after World War II, you're going to see a huge inflation. We talked about the hyperinflation uh, in Germany, in, in which basically the German government, to pay off its war debts, is going to print a ton of money. And when they do that, they cause the value of the German mark to just plummet. It's just it's basically worthless by the time we get to 1932. Uh, and there's just there's there's no wealth. People have lost entire life savings um, during this time frame uh, in Germany, and, and they're just they're kind of confused on uh, on what to uh, on what to do. And we have this really weak, uh, ineffective uh, democratic government that's run by the Weimar um, Republic, right? I think it maybe I called the Duma uh, government in, in another video, but it's the Weimar. Um, Republic, the Duma government was in the uh, is it was in Russia, and so hopefully I, hopefully I, I did that correctly. But anyways, the the uh, Vomir government uh, of of Germany is is a democratically elected government. It's just it's just not very effective for what it needs. And Germany's used to, you know, Germany has a history of um, or a very short history, I suppose, of being led by a monarch or by a Kaiser, some kind of some kind of a king. And so this idea, this transition to democracy is, is new and ultimately democracy is horribly messy. It's just, it's not, uh, it's not a very um, efficient form of government. It's by far the best form of government. It gives uh, the largest percentage of people a voice in their government. But one of the things that it does, it's slow moving and it, it, it's a little bit messy. And so a lot of these uh, Germans that are having a hard time following um, following the First World War are going to turn to extremist groups looking for answers to this period of economic uncertainty. The workers are going. The workers that had had uh, been part of the industrialization of Germany are going to turn towards communism and, and looking for some sort of redistribution of wealth. Um, the military and the upper class are going to look to some sort of uh, some sort of strongman type thing where um, you know they're going to have a um, a clear leader. Uh, you know, they're looking to return to some type of a monarch. Um, and, and Hitler and uh, the National Socialists are going to offer that type of a leadership, a very clear, easy to understand dictatorship uh, of, of of leaders, right? And so during this time frame, that's when you're going to see this National Socialist German Workers' Party uh, come out. Okay, um, Hitler's the part the party leader, uh, and he's going to come out and he's going to blame the defeat of World War One and of Germany and World War One on on traitors against the country. Remember, the socialist uh, government are the ones that that signed the peace deal, not necessarily the uh, the monarch, uh, because the uh, the Kaiser had advocated the throne. Uh, he's going to blame uh, Jewish people because of their involvement in uh, in banking and uh, in in Germany. And um, Hitler obviously is anti-Semitic, uh, cowards, just people that can't stand up to uh, can't stand up to the Europeans, people that aren't Jew or aren't German um, or don't don't possess the, the the proper attributes to run a nation. And then ultimately the communists, because the communists and the National Socialists are at odds with each other, um, not necessarily politically, but also in Germany for actual power. Uh, Hitler uh, accuses the Vladimir government of being weak when uh, they, they signed the Treaty of Versailles and believe that Germany had never really lost World War One. And again, uh, Hitler is a is a World War One veteran. He fought for the Austrians. He's Austrian by birth. Um, believe that uh, in his sec his segment of the war, the Austrians were actually victorious. They were winning at the time of defeat, and so he, it's not um, it's not uncommon. Uh, this is not an uncommon held belief in Germany and in in places in Austria or members of the um, Central Powers during World War One that that Germany and the Central Powers had not lost the war. Again, 
we kind of talked about that idea of a clear understanding of defeat, and that was never achieved uh, during the First World War. Uh, Hitler sees this impact of Mussolini on Italy, and he starts to model himself after is he starts to model himself after Mussolini. He starts to model this Nationalist Socialist Party after the Fascist Party uh, founded by Mussolini in Italy in 1919. And so by 1923, he forms a gang of Nazis that would go around and they would beat up Jews and they would beat up other perceived en uh, enemies um, of the German state. Um, they, they would attack uh, communists. Um, and, and really, in the early 1920s, Germany is in a, in a state of almost um, civil war between the National Socialist and, uh, and the Communist Party. Uh, and, and, and the democratic governments are really just powerless to stop it. And so um, it's going to spin a little bit out of control. Uh, in 1923, Hitler and his uh, group are going to run, lead an unsuccessful overthrow of the government that you're going to read about in uh, the assignments. Um, and in jail, he writes a book called Mein Kampf. It just outlines his political aspirations and how he wants to lead Germany. He talks about forming this one German state and expanding eastward into, into communist held lands to feed the German people. Um, you know, and um, in 1932, when he actually comes to power, uh, Mein Kampf is one of the uh, top selling books in the world. And it's a popular gift for uh, college graduates um, at that point. Um, so from 1919, 1920, the, uh, the German government, 1921, the German government is, is in dire straits. There's hyperinflation. There's lots of problems. And the Germ and the uh, Americans actually reach out to Germany during this this time, and we create something called the Dawes Plan, which is uh, it's going to encourage American banks to loan money to Germany to allow their economy to recover from from the war. And from 1920, really till 1929, late 1920, early 1929, um, the uh, the plan works very well. Uh, the problem is after uh, 1929, um, in October 1929, you have the, the market crash and this global depression that's going to follow. Uh, and by 1932, people in Germany are, are jobless and foodless and hopeless, and they're willing to listen about anybody for answers. Um, if you look closely, this picture is, is not very accurate because it's obviously the, 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 the wording on the windows is in English. So this is, this is a picture from America during the depression. Uh, but, you know, it could have been anywhere worldwide uh, during, during this time frame. Uh, in 1932, both communists and Nazis gained seats in the uh, German parliament. I think the Nazi party controls a little bit more than 10% of, uh, of political seats in this parliament. And uh, bankers and business leaders persuade um, uh, Germany's president to name Hitler uh, chancellor of, uh, of Germany um, to create this unified government to work with the Nazis instead of working with the communists. Um, and once Hitler comes into power, he promises to create this new Germany. He's going to uh, he's going to start uh, to rebuild the nation's government or re, um, sorry the nation's military, uh, instill a, a new sense of national pride. Um, he builds this huge autobahn of this uh, this highway that connects um, connects these major German cities. Um, and, um, starts the rearmament program of building. Um, you know, artillery shells and artillery cannons and tanks and eventually airplanes and uh, whatnot. And so it's going to allow uh, for new opportunities for people of, of modest background to, to take jobs within uh, the German government um, where maybe there wasn't opportunity before. And so Hitler basically is just going to spend his way into uh, creating um, economic prosperity uh, for the German nation from 1932 um, until, you know, the, the start of, of World War I. Um, and on the economic side, you know, people will look at what, what Hitler was doing and, and they'll actually be envious. There'll, there'll be people in the United States that will compare Roosevelt to Hitler and, and, you know, wish that they would have had something similar because of the economic prosperity that Germany was experiencing uh, during the 1930s. But Germany already kind of went through its depression and was using this... Um, Art rearmament a push led by the Nazis to um, to fuel its its economy um, for all of the economic advancements. Obviously, the Germany was going to go through. You're going to have um, vast uh, social problems. 
um, the Nazis are going to implement uh, very strict anti-Semitic censorship. Uh, you're going you're gonna to see book burnings of books that either pr praise democracy or, um, you know, were written by Jewish people. The schools are put under the control of the government uh, and, and taught to, um, and uh, the curriculum is is forced out by the National Socialist Party. Um, Anti-Semitism becomes the official government policy of the Germans and Jews in Germany from 1932 um onward really after 1935 um uh anti-semitism is, is going to be um out of control in germany your, your jews are going to lose rights to german citizenship they're going to lose rights to own their own property to hold specific jobs like being a teacher or a doctor or um, an actor um, they couldn't own newspapers um, in 1938 november 10th 1938 uh, we have basically the uh, beginning of what is referred to as, um, well, you have Kristinok, which is the uh, the night of broken glass in which um, the SS members and the German military basically declare war on the Jewish population uh, in Germany. Uh, they go into synagogues, they break up synagogues, they destroy German-owned uh, businesses. Um, you know, there's accounts of of the police or German uh, military grabbing um, Jewish citizens and, and dragging them out of or Jewish people in Germany and dragging them out in the streets and executing them. Um, it, and so while things were bad before 1938, things get um, very, very bad uh, following. Uh, it's going to lead to a mass exodus of Jewish people in the 1930s from, from Germany. And Jews are going to leave Germany in record numbers. Um, the problem is a lot of nations are going through the Great Depression. And so they're gonna restrict immigration uh, from, from nations and places like the United States are gonna place limits on the number of ethnic Jews that are gonna be allowed into the United States. Places like uh, Great Britain are gonna restrict uh, Jewish immigration. Uh, Jews are going to um, immigrate to places like France, uh, Ethiopia. Um, many Jews will try to go to this new uh, territory called Israel. Um, but the vast majority of Jews that are going to flee Germany during this time frame are going to move east into places like Czechoslovakia or eastern Russia, which um, it has traditionally been seen as, um, you know, the Jewish uh, the Jewish area of, of Europe. And unfortunately for these Jews, um, uh, when World War II breaks out and the, and the, the Germans um, start to expand their territory eastward, uh, they're going to get caught and uh, persecuted. And, and uh, a vast majority of the victims of the, um, the German Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, are going to come from um, Eastern Europe. Um, in, in the places that many Jews fleeing Germany had uh, settled. Uh, Japan um, is going to be a, the other member of the Axis powers um, that, that, that's going to rise up during this time frame. Um, we, we talked briefly during imperialism that in the 1850s, the United States opened Japan up for trade with the West and trying to avoid some of the pitfalls that uh, befell on China or on um on India, Japan didn't trade for necessarily uh, consumer items that they would trade for military technologies. Uh, and so Japan modernizes very quickly from the 1850s um, into the 1920s, 1940s. Um, and so by you know 1940, uh, Japan's a, a major force in the world. Um, the problem is in, in the 1920s, just like everybody else, the late 1920s, uh, Japan is going to be subject to um, this uh, global economy that's going to shrink and cause um, a lot of people to worry. And so there's going to be a rise in military extremism in Japan. Uh, many, pe many people in Japan are going to look at um, you know, the rise of Hitler or the rise of Mussolini uh, and, and see hope there. They're also, Japan's going to be part of that imperialist group that's going to go out and um, control China. Uh, Japan is is led by some imperialism ideology. This idea of um, kind of a one nation, um, a, a one nation state for Asians, uh, Asia for Asians, led by Japan. Uh, Japan is also led by an emperor. 
who um, is an absolute the absolute ruler of the state. He's going to um, have basically absolute power. Uh, and in fact, he's worshipped basically as a deity um, in Japan during this time frame. Uh, Japan's basically a small little nation there off of the coast of China and North Korea and Russia. Um, you know, it's it's roughly 70 million um, people uh, in the area of uh, the size roughly of Montana. Uh, it's a small island in the fact that it, it lacks natural resources like oil and coal and iron uh, for industry. And so they, they would have to use trade to get those things. And so after the 1920s, the economy is going to kind of take a uh, is going to kind of take a dip, and, and the Japanese government is going to fall into the hands. I'm sorry, it's going to fall into the hands of uh, extremist military groups. And in 1931, Japan is going to invade Manchuria, which is a section of China above uh, above China, <laughs> looking for natural resources. And the rest of the world is going to. Um, react very negatively, criticizing Japan. The League of Nations is going to criticize their actions, uh, and Japan is going to leave, but they're ultimately going to set up a puppet state, which is an independent uh, independent nation, uh, but it's dominated by uh, by another country. And so while uh, Manchuria is, is ruled by uh, Manchuria, they're directed by China. Um, and the United States is upset, but they're unable necessarily to defend this uh, this idea because uh, the United States is really interested, still interested in trade with China. They want to open up trade with China. They want to keep trade with China. Uh, and, and they want to keep this idea of an open door policy. But also in 1931, the United States is in the depths of the Depression. So they don't have the economic power to really punish the Japanese. And they don't have the will to go to war over uh, Manchuria. So the League of Nations denounces the Japanese actions in Manchuria. But then all Japan does without... Uh, with the League of Nations not having a military arm or a way to enforce um, their their rulings or their denouncements, um, Japan just kind of laughs and leaves the League of Nations. They withdraw from the League of Nations, and the League of Nations can't do anything to them. Um, because of this, um, they're going to join into this uh, Axis Powers Pact uh, with Italy and uh, and Germany. Germany was excluded from the League of Nations in uh, following the Second World War. Um, Italy is going to join the League of Nations, but when they invade um, Ethiopia, um, they will also be condemned by the League of Nations and just leave. Um, and so Japan, Italy, and Germany are all going to enter into this tripartite pact, uh, which is going to form the Axis powers. And these are going to be the enemies of the United States and France and Germany during the, uh, during the war. Uh, by 1935, Mussolini hadn't improved the Italian economic situation. Unemployment, unemployment poverty are still very high. Um, you know, the economic downturns of the world are still going to be causing problems. Uh, he has by this point rebuilt the. Um, he has by this point. Uh, he has by this point rebuilt the um, Italian military, uh, and he decides to try to use that to um, to gain territory, and he invades Ethiopia. Uh, the League of Nations once again condemns Italy, but has no real power to stop them. Italy, uh, France, and Britain don't necessarily want to fight Italy at this point, point. Uh, and Italy just leaves the League of Nations very similar to what Japan does in nineteen um, in nineteen thirty one. Um, and so he joins a specific alliance between Italy and uh, Germany. Hitler and Mussolini have this weird relationship in which they kind of copy each other for a long period of time. Hitler copies Mussolini on his rise to power. Mussolini has that army of black shirts. Hitler's going to have a, his own little private army of dudes running around in brown shirts. Um, Mussolini's going to be really impressed with the German uh, military, um, you know, their marching and their ability to do different things. And so he's going to base his military a lot on what they do, although they're not nearly as efficient as the, uh, as the, uh, German, um, the German military. Um, and so, like, by the time Hitler kind of grows up with a man crush on Mussolini, is what I like to uh, like to present. And then Mussolini, by the time that he comes to power, he kind of has a, a crush on Hitler, and Hitler's kind of over Mussolini at that point. Um, but 1935 to 1938 is going to see, uh, is see uh, Germany start to expand its military powers and territorial gains. Um, 
1935, Hitler announces that he's no longer going to obey the Treaty of Versailles and starts to rebuild the German army. In 1936, in March of 36, Hitler marches into the Rhineland, which was this military zone between France, a deep military zone between France and Germany. Um, and 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 it's it's just it's just this area it's this area right here um off the rhine river um hitler just uh, the german army just goes back in and recaptures and they don't do anything and france and britain don't respond and to be honest they probably could have and they probably could have um i don't know if they would have prevented world war ii but it would have been a little bit different uh if they would have responded to this this first aggression uh, and and they, but they they don't respond, and there's a number of reasons. The first one could just be the memories of the First World War and the fact that you know ten to twenty million people die. Uh, the second one is just the sphere of the Soviet, uh, uh, the 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 uh, communists in Russia. Oh, excuse me, it's it's late in the afternoon here. Uh, the sphere of Sovietism, uh, Soviet communism in Russia. If you have a strong Germany to act as a barrier between communism. In Russia and France, well, then you know, hey, that's a that's a pretty good idea, and so you're going to allow the uh, the Nazis and the Germans to build strength, so that way that they would have to fight, um, so they would have to fight um, uh, the uh, the Soviets first. Uh, by 1935, uh, most of the politicians that had been part of the uh, Treaty of Versailles um, had had fallen out of power. And so a new generation of politicians have seen the, the negative effects of that treaty on Germany and, 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 and want to, um, you know, want to help Germany out. They, they, they noticed that, hey, you know, maybe Germany has some pretty valid objections to uh, some of the conditions uh, of the uh, Treaty of Versailles. And then finally, ultimately, they hope for peace. You know, I mean, we just went through not too long ago. I mean, it would have been, um, what, like 20 years Um before you you have you have a global conflict in Europe, and so you know they're, they're hoping that hey you know maybe maybe we could have a compromise, and we're not going to have a madman um, come out and um, and and lead us into war. And of course, that's exactly what's hap going to happen. But just one of those things that the Germans don't. Uh, in 1938, the Germans uh, launch um, an annexation of Austria. They hold an election. Um, where something like 98% of the Austrian population uh, votes to, to join Germany. Obviously, it's a rigged election because you can't get 98% of people to do anything. Um, Hitler now wants, after he's taken Austria and the Rhineland, he, he argues that he needs to reunite the German-speaking people of uh, Czechoslovakia. He wants uh, something called the Rhine or the um, Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. And the Czechs have an agreement with France that if uh, you know if they're attacked, that the French will come in and protect them. Uh, and the French don't necessarily want to fight without the British. Uh, and and so we we host something that's referred to as the Munich Conference. Um, and uh, everyone in, in, in Munich, except for the Czechoslovakians, agrees because well, the Czechoslovakians aren't even invited to this conference. Agrees to give the Germans. Um, the Sudetenland in exchange that Hitler's not going to ask for any more territorial demands. Um, and uh, the prime minister of England, who was Neville Church uh, Chamberlain at that point, returns back to England and makes this uh, famous speech where he says he went to, to Munich or went to, uh, yeah, he went to Munich uh, and, and he meets, uh, looked Hitler in the eye and he believes them to be a man of his word and that they've achieved, achieved peace in their time. Um, and then Winston Churchill, who famously goes on to become prime minister of England during the war, says that basically the uh, the men at, uh, at uh, Munich were given a choice. They could either have war or they could have disgrace. And so they chose disgrace, but they're going to have war as well, um, which is one of Churchill's famous quotes. Um, and it's kind of fun. Uh, and, and just like Churchill predicted, uh, Hitler goes ahead and takes all of uh, Czechoslovakia. He takes the Sudetenland and just keeps on rolling and takes all of the Czech Republic, all of Czechoslovakia, um, claiming that he must free the people of Poland, the German pe people um, of Poland. Hitler threatens to take um, a, the chunk, a chunk of Poland. And so Italy, um, Italy attacks the, um, um, the Balkans um, across the Adriatic Sea. 
Albania and the Balkans and, and France and England start to realize that, hey, they're, 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 the war is going to be inevitable. It's going to happen. And so they start to reach out to Russia to try to form an alliance similar to what they had during the First World War. Uh, the problem is in April of, or I'm sorry, in August of 1939, uh, the, the Russians and the Germans make an announcement that they've reached uh, some sort of an alliance uh, where they signed a non-aggression pact, where the Germans and the Russians are not necessarily in an alliance, but they're in an agreement that they're not going to attack each other. And so we have this cartoon here where Hitler's taking his hat off to Joseph Stalin, and he says, the scum of the earth, I believe, and Stalin is responding as the bloody assassin of the workers, I presume. And they're, they're doing this over the bodies of the people in Poland. And so with this, this agreement of, um, of, of, the, Poli or of uh, the Russians and the Germans, it's going to open the, uh, open the door for the conflict that's ultimately going to lead to the Second World War. And that's what we will come back to next video and talk about. So hopefully we learned a little something there. And we will uh, we'll be back shortly. Thank you. Bye-bye.